Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. Will, I I almost thought you had a turkey behind you, but then I remembered who you are. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and notice that that is indeed a duck. Damn it. I knew I needed to blur my background. <laughs> you asked me, should I blur my background? I was like, no, why don't you just leave it? Why don't we just leave it? Well, that I way did, if, I, if well, we do I blur- have somebody jump on our YouTube uh, to watch us in this and look at how silly we yeah. look, they can admire the lack of turkeys in your background. All five of them. <laughs> uh Well, you know, I was debating whether or not to blur it, but, you know, the algorithm that whatever Zoom uses to figure out what's you and what's your background couldn't decide about my microphone. Yeah. And so it kept making (laughs) me look like I was missing half my jaw. Yeah. And uh, and I didn't want, you know, our five YouTube followers to see that either. You know, we have six. I need all my mom. Okay. My mom got on YouTube. Well, (laughs) I need all the help I can get with looking better. So, you know. Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. No, I, uh, I thought that was funny when, when we had Craig on recently and, and, uh, he yeah. immediately keyed in on the bear in the background. <laughs> so, but I think you just recording that sound room is an excuse not to have turkeys behind you. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're going to say. <laughs> it, it would mess with the acoustics of the room, yeah. right? Yeah. Feathers actually, they, they really do dampen the, the thing. I wanted my, my voice to be crisp, crisp. <laughs> for this one so well i i have kind of a general opening question for you uh we you know we had three people who are all very well respected turkey people you know they're they're serving a little bit different role at least uh adam does but all of them are are big voices important namesakes in the the field and we really wanted to get at this this uh, question of season frameworks and harvests and, and whether or not that is leading to some of the declines that we've been seeing, some of these symptoms, of, or at least in some places. I was curious from your perspective, do you think that we have settled that? <laughs> Just going straight to it, right? Yeah. No, I, you know, I I feel like, so where I was at, on the effects of season date um, and particularly, you know, whether or not starting early relative to nesting um, is a major influencing factor on the declines in productivity was, you know, maybe, maybe before we had these podcasts, you know, I left the the door kind of halfway open to that. Like I, I thought, you know, especially Mike has made some very convincing arguments in that regard. Um, I'm a habitat guy, I always go back to habitat. So, you know, that's, that's been a factor that has been at the forefront of my mind, as well as all these others, mm. all, all these other potential things, like some of which we've already talked about in previous podcasts, predation, um, others will get to such as disease and things of that nature. But, um, it's hard not to look at the data that was presented to us from, you know, two different studies that were specifically designed to try to address this question. And then Mike even mentioned that he had some data that kind of indirectly addressed that from Georgia. And it's, you know, in light of that, not to see that door in my mind closing a little bit further, that this is becoming less plausible. Yeah. Well, I kind of, it definitely for me brought up some questions that I had not been thinking of. And and maybe uh, that's Mm -hmm. one thing we should try to, illuminate here uh one thing that you know as practicing scientists one one thing that's not necessarily as obvious to those folks that don't do this for a living is it's very hard to have certainty 
on anything. Yes. And, uh, you know, even when we feel certain about something, we start to realize how, how weak that can be, especially when something, you know, new data is presented that makes us rethink the way that we were thinking about it. And I, I think that's kind right. of, you know, I want to caveat with that, that I, I have plenty of, of, uh, those kinds of things in my research program and know them well, where, you know, I had a really clear idea of how things work yeah. and then I'd figure yeah. out later when we get more data that that's not true and uh um, right or, or that it was you know some a different mechanism or something like that and I, I think that's kind of what came from this for me uh with with yeah. all of these folks that that are very knowledgeable about this is there's still enough uncertainty yeah that we're not sure about the mechanisms but, yeah and i think I, I was actually you know pondering about this on on the way back over here from lunch you know coming back to the office just driving in my truck turn the radio off to pontificate if you will for a little bit that's when i do some of my best thinking and um that's not saying much but yeah it's better than better than normal i'm gonna let you have at that, that time i'm gonna just let you go with it. <laughs> but uh you know i guess where i'm at as far as the bottom line is I think that there's still enough uncertainty that more research is needed and justified. And if I had the opportunity to, to design a project specifically addressing this is, issue, I think it is warranted. Yeah. Um, I think there's still enough plausibility there and uncertainty there that the work needs to continue. It's yeah. not totally settled. Although, like I said earlier, um, I think I've seen enough so far to start, you know, tipping mm -hmm. the scales in, in a different direction. Yeah. Well, after particularly Adam's uh, stuff, they they and he he acknowledged, uh, you know, that it's still preliminary, and we need to all keep that in mind, you know, because sometimes things change. You get a, a little extra data, or you change the the way that you need to analyze it, or whatever, and and things can change. But you know, that's a long term ex experiment that's pretty well mm -hmm. done. I yeah. mean, you you have a really strong design there, and it's not the typical metrics that we are using to quantify productivity. But, uh, you know, I would have expected after four years of manipulating the season dates on a WMA where, where the, or, or multiple WMAs, I should say, where the hunting pressure is probably pretty high. I would, mm -hmm. I would have probably, I would have expected to see some movement there. Yeah. And I've got a couple notes here. So, they did not record changes related to the number of turkeys encountered, the catch per unit effort. So basically, you know, how intent, how much hunters have to hunt in order yeah. to harvest a bird or in Jake encounters. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they recorded any more response variables than that, but they definitely, well, he, I noted those that they yeah, saw no response. He was definitely really clear on those. And, you know, especially the, the, the Jake data i think it's pretty telling i mean that that's a pretty good mm -hmm. indication you know that you're not seeing a difference in recruitment yeah so right. to me i i would have expected a few things if you know if if the seizing day uh, coupled with high harvest rate you know where we're killing a lot of the birds really early relative to before nests are started yeah. And that was disrupting it and delaying it. I, I was kind of struggling with why would we not immediately see, mm -hmm. you know, like, okay, we have a bunch of mature gobblers that are dominating the breeding and I can see where taking them out could interrupt that. And the hen has to reassess mm -hmm. and that delay and her to a little bit later. Uh, mm -hmm. the, one of the recent papers that actually just came out where we had access to it uh suggests that might be up to a week uh mm -hmm. at least within that yeah what they were looking at in that one uh why wouldn't that just change back if you didn't so in other words if the mechanism is okay we've got a bunch of gobblers that are competing for the hens and then they've established who's going to do what and you remove them and that immediately causes this delay but i don't see mm -hmm. why if you okay let's change the season dates and now that didn't happen this year as long as there's mature gobblers that that yeah. to me essentially what would happen then is okay 
the gobblers don't get interrupted and then the hens don't get delayed and you should immediately mm-hmm. see that correct i would think right right i would agree you know i can't really think of an explanation as to why it would take you know i mean maybe maybe a i don't know it seems like it would be immediate um but like in mississippi you know adam was saying that they've monitored that population for 4 years yeah you know, and they still haven't seen anything. Well, and, it, and, and then, in four years, you know, if we, if the majority of the breeding is being done by two or three or even four year old birds, you would, you should even, I mean, you you basically have a whole turnover of the breeding stock. Yeah. In that time. And a hunted population. Exactly. That's, that's what I was thinking too. In a hunted population on a wildlife management area, you would expect over a four year time span, most of that population has turned over. Mm-hmm. So they were never exposed to the earlier season date. Now, the one caveat that I will mention related to that work that was implemented in Mississippi is they only shifted the season date back to April 1st. Yeah. And that's still, you know, a couple of weeks before most hens start nesting, Mm -hmm. uh, which isn't in alignment with that recommendation that was made in the Isabel paper where they, you know, talked, it was a Southeast wild turkey working Mm -hmm. group that put that together. And they talked about the the earliest possible opening date to align with, you know, this, this population process, if that's what, if it's mm-hmm. what's occurring um, would be, you know, peak nest initiation. And they said a more, even more conservative approach would be to move it all the way back to peaks, you know, the median incubation date. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I think almost everyone would agree that not starting to hunt the bird until late April would just, you know, it would probably result in losing a lot of turkey hunters. Um, and the ones that are remaining, I think, would would probably get very politically active in trying not to make that happen mm-hmm. because that's a, such a significant loss of opportunity. Yeah. So it wouldn't be palatable to hunters at all. Um, but just kind of circling back to make that point, you know, it, it is possible that the treatment, in this case being the season opening delay, was not sufficient to elicit a response in the Mississippi study. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, one, another thing that I, I think it, maybe this is the time to, to put it in there. One thing that they all agreed on, uh, and I think we both do, is that harvesting 80% of the gobblers right before they're doing all this, that's probably not a good idea. Yeah. But uh, the interesting thing that you just highlighted from the Mississippi study is they didn't actually see a decrease in the harvest. Right. The the, the right. same number of birds got harvested. It just was in a They different, just got harvested later. Yeah, it was just two weeks later. Yeah. Uh, so that is an interesting thing because if you were thinking about changing the season dates to try to, to modulate the hunting pressure in terms of how many mm-hmm. birds are getting removed, it didn't seem to do that in that case. Yeah. But if the important issue here is not necessarily the number of birds that's removed compared to when they are removed, It is good to know that moving the season date back um, does not result in a loss of harvest, Mm -hmm. right? So hunters are still potentially harvesting the same number of bird that should help with, you know, maintaining satisfaction. Right. And at least I'm going to tell you what, some of my most memorable birds, you know, uh, like two of the three, (laughs) that was a joke. (laughs) Uh some of the most memorable birds that I've taken over the years, they were on fire. I mean, they, they were double and triple and quadruple goblin. They were, Mm -hmm. they were going crazy. Yeah. And, you know, one of them, I remember it, that, that song, and we heard him gobble almost as far as you can hear one gobble. And Mm I made a peep at him, you know, just like, just en- enough to get him interested and he i mean he ran mm-hmm. you know through and it was through longleaf pine it was a beautiful yeah. thing yeah but he just gobbled while i mean he didn't even stop he's just gobbling and running yeah. like i didn't even right. know they would do that you know <laughs> it was so it's just imprinted on my brain like i've never experienced such excitement because that thing like he was ready he's ready to go and mm-hmm. the whole point of that is, speaking of that hunter satisfaction, some of that might come out 
of that delay, like Adam was saying, that yeah, the, the hunters did hear the same individuals gobbling more because you know they were they got to that point where they were super hot before they were taken. Exactly, so, and I don't have any data on that here in Alabama, but you know, for this this uh, spring twenty two season. Uh, Alabama implemented an opening date delay for the first time in a while. Um, I say in a while, I don't, I don't know if they've done it before or not, but they implemented a mm. delay in season date opening. And I talked to several hunters that said that they felt like the, the birds were gobbling harder on opening weekend than the, what they were accustomed to. And these are guys that are very avid turkey mm-hmm. hunters and that they did seem to be re- more responsive to calling. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, maybe – well, those that, are some silver linings yeah. of take. You know, you do take away some opportunity, but well, there's silver linings to that as well. You know, and the, I think that's important to think about. You know, that some of this is a hunter satisfaction, some of it's biological, and we're trying to weigh those yep. things. And I can see personally, you know, as a hunter, I kind of want there to be a lot of gobblers all over the place when they're going crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So right. like, I, you know, if I need to not hunt this Saturday and instead of go next Saturday, but next Saturday they're going to melt the woods. Yeah. Like I'm okay with that, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, you don't have to worry about in that scenario, um, boogering up the birds before they're actually receptive. Yeah. You know, they figure out pretty quickly when the hunt's on, everybody yeah. knows that. Um, so why not just wait until they're primed for it, right. you know, instead of exposing them to that pressure? Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, at, at least from, it seemed like that they all agreed on that point, you know, that, that there may be some, some hunter satisfaction benefits. Mm-hmm. At least I didn't hear anybody say anything that made me think they, they wouldn't be in line with that. Uh, yeah. And, and I can I can relate to that as a hunter. So I think really the question is, is the timing, a, you know, a, a negative influence or even a detriment to the productivity? Yeah. And uh, that that's where I think we still have some uncertainty. We, right. we really need to, you know, try to address. And, and all those guys, they are. And we are. Right. Uh, that's one of the principal things that we're very interested in with the the uh, Florida turkey work that we're starting up to. Sure. So, you know, I think it's of central interest, and we're all trying to address it. It's just it's one of those things that's really difficult to address, and the the whether or not that timing is negatively influencing the productivity, I think, it is something that we really need to focus on and try to figure out. Right. And so circling back to one of the topics that we talked about just a little while ago, um, when you asked me if I could think of a reason why it would take, you know, multiple years for the birds to respond to uh, a delay in the season opening. um, And my answer was generally no, I can't really see why that would take multiple years. And especially, you know, like in Mississippi where they've given them four years, you think it would have happened by then. Yeah, and I, and I was then, a little bit worried about the sensitivity on that one. Yeah. But uh, then I remembered, because they were the their source of recruitment was from the the polt. I mean, not polts, the jakes, mm-hmm. not from fallen yeah. polts. Sure, sure. But then I remembered but, uh, that Mike said that uh, the males don't disperse very far, so they, they actually are the ones that should have been pretty much resident. Based on that. Right, right. So, but yeah, go ahead. that makes sense. Sorry. Well, I mean, the point that I was going to make is that, you know, you would expect to see, I, I think I would, you would expect to see a fairly rapid response, but, um, you know, one thing that, that Craig shared was that, um, they didn't see a shift in median incubation dates. And then Mike also shared that they haven't seen any difference in the median incubation date on the Savannah river site. And that population that has been unhunted for many, many years is still the same as their adjacent or, or proximal site um, that is hunted. Mm-hmm. And I believe that other site is is a wildlife management area, so it's fairly intensively hunted. 
Um, and so in neither of those instances are they seeing a shift in response to that season delay. And furthermore, one of the caveats that I mentioned about the Mississippi study was that the delay was only till April 1, so it's still a couple weeks out from initiation of nesting. But in the Tennessee study, you know, Craig said that they delayed the season in those experimental county experimental counties to middle of April, April 14th through 15th. Mm -hmm. um, and that that aligns really well with the init median initiation date uh, for hens in that area. So yeah. they did take the recommended approach by that document that was put forth mm -hmm. by the Southeast Wild Turkey uh, Working Group. And they still didn't see a shift. Yeah. In, so in other words, in the, average initiation, the dates. Mississippi one didn't delay it all the way to the time that sort of mm -hmm. being well, proposed as the the key mm -hmm. time, but the, the yeah. Tennessee one did. It, it did. Yeah. So yeah, that's an interesting point. And then they were tracking some of those more traditional metrics of production in the Tennessee one. It, sure. I, I think the problem there is that it hasn't. It, you know, we've only had what two or three years of post data. I think they, right, the, yeah, two years, yeah. So two years post delay. And they have a third one planned, and I know that they're that's right. They may even uh, have a fourth one, right? So I know uh, Craig is. Uh, he didn't say it on the air, but uh, I think he's working on trying to get a fourth year lined up as well. So, mm -hmm. but yeah. just like everything with us, we've got to figure out how to fund these things. And, and, uh, that sometimes is tricky. Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially long-term stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's hard for a state and, and I understand where they're coming from totally to commit to, you know, and I think there may be even some stipulations in the federal funding that they use to match mm -hmm. for these types of research projects as to how long they can fund a given project for. Right. I think it's, you know, a five-year timeline or something like that. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that we discussed pretty extensively with both Craig and Adam that was really interesting to me was these patterns in population growth and population decline relative to the timing of restocking efforts. Mm -hmm. That was super interesting because, you know, over the past couple years, as I've started to think more and more about this whole issue, one of the things that I've found very perplexing is that so many, the, the declines in harvest that so many states are experiencing are so closely aligned chronologically with each other. Mm -hmm. And so that's had me thinking, you know, what is the one issue? What is the one change biologically that has occurred, that occurred in that time period that could be affecting all these populations simultaneously? And so my mind immediately goes to something related to disease or predation, or did we have a big season date change that coincided with that time period? And the answer to that one is no. Um, and I feel like the population trajectory relative to timing of restocking is the first hypothesis that I've ever heard um, that makes some sense to me. Yeah. I'm, I'm and you, you know what I'm talking about with that? Oh yeah. Yeah. You're, you remember the specifics? It, well, I don't remember the actual numbers specifically, but the general idea is that the declines sort of correspond to what we would expect on that logistic curve. I try to say carrying capacity curve because I don't, yeah. I don't know that uh, I think that resonates with people probably better than our scientists. But, uh, yeah. you know, that carrying capacity curve, we if you restock a population, you'd kind of expect this really rapid growth in population size, almost exponential. And then that would eventually hit some maximum, you know, it kind of overshoots what is sustainable. And then you'd see a correction mm -hmm. where you'd have a decline and then it would kind of hover around that line. Yeah. And most people think about that with deer populations. Mm -hmm. And the issue with deer populations is they're a large herbivore and their herbivory, their, you know, their foraging behavior can impact carrying capacity of their own habitat. They can decrease habitat quality by selecting for the most preferred plants and essentially creating localized, ec, you know, extinction of those high quality forage plants. But turkeys don't do that. So, you know, the way that I typically explain this, if we talk about it in class, like to my students, actually, I talked to them about this, this very topic earlier this week is, you know, maybe it's something else with turkeys. There's a, there's another limiting factor besides forage. Yeah. Uh, for example, maybe it's just a lack of optimal nesting sites. 
And so we've got more and more hens being pushed out into areas mm -hmm. that aren't conducive to supporting a successful nest. And so you see nest success rates go down. Well, I think that is an important point. We inherently, I actually just talked about this in my class too. For some <laughs> reason, what we think about food as being limited, that, that, mm -hmm. that has to be the thing limiting them or, or predators. Yeah. Right. Either they their food or if they are food, one of those two factors has to be what's limiting the population. And the fact of the matter is, it's not ne not necessarily those two. Right. And I think that might be something that's kind of tricky with turkeys, especially when they have you know the, the uh, vastly different needs at different life stages. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's they also have a different structure in terms of their their. Uh, you know their their behavior and everything. There there are lots of other factors that could become limiting, even though there's plenty of food around. Now, yeah. I'm not I'm not saying that food isn't a problem. I'm just saying we shouldn't assume that that's the only problem. So, sure. But I think you're keying in right on that. Like, okay, uh, I've heard Mike talk about this before, and he has tons of data on on hen nests all over the place. But he talks about the hens won't nest next to each other. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't have that much nesting cover and they don't like nesting near each other, well, then some of them are going to be out of luck and they're going to yeah. end up nesting in really bad places. Yeah. And from a natural selection perspective, it makes sense for them to nest apart because, you know, if a predator finds one nest and they're concentrated in an area, it's yeah. probably going to find others. Yeah. Don't put all your eggs in one one nest. <laughs> there's so man. There's so many turkey ponds. <laughs> oh man, there's so many. Well, I, I um, think that yeah, so, that's some good, interesting stuff. And one thing that I wanted to kind of add to that to get everybody thinking about this: when we think about the the hunting season pressure and frameworks and everything, and the fact that they've been in place in a lot of these places for a long time you know, decades long in some cases where right. the season framework has essentially not changed. I was trying to think of some mechanisms for the declining poult per hand over decades, yeah. which I think uh, from my, uh, you know, their work is pretty compelling on that, showing a pretty clear trend in a lot of places where mm -hmm. poults per hand have been declining. And I was trying to think why, what mechanistically could the hunting season do how, how could it cause that pattern because i would expect mm -hmm. based on if we had the if the season was such that we had an intensive harvest right before the breeding and it initiated that cascade of events i would have expected that you know we would have had pretty high pulp per hen but then all of a sudden we kind of hit this threshold where that harvest got too high and then it would really sharply decline and then it would stabilize mm -hmm. at some really low rate in comparison. Not, mm -hmm. you know, we had we had three pulse per hen, and then that slowly declined over a decade, and that was two pulse per hen, and then that slowly declined mm -hmm. for another decade, and then we bought them out at one. I wouldn't have expected mm -hmm. that pattern. Yeah. But that is consistent with what you might expect in the density dependence thing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, if we kind of got up to near that density, we sort of get to that level where you should see productivity decline that's commensurate, where it sort of stabilizes around that. And then you may even see that steady decline if that line, you know, whatever that carrying capacity was, if that line started moving down. Yeah. Which all of them talked about. Yep. Uh, you know, they if did. you... If you move that carrying capacity, changing line down, lands, yeah, changing landscape, increasing human population, exactly, and that that makes a lot of sense to me. And it dawned on me while you were bringing this up a minute ago. Here's another really interesting take on this. I, I don't know what the rate of population growth is in all these different places, but I do, in terms of human population, I do know that they are different. Mm -hmm. So. Like, I think Tennessee is probably the human population is growing more rapidly than Alabama, is my guess. Probably. Uh, and Mississippi as well. But uh, Florida is probably growing pretty fast. Florida is really fast. North Carolina yeah. is really fast. So, my, my point is 
I wonder if we could key in on that that uh, human effect of expansion. Like, if you, what is the rate of population growth and the rate of the associated intra- infrastructure infringing mm-hmm. on turkey habitat? And does that explain any of the variation that we're seeing in the timing of this stuff? Yeah, that'd be really interesting to look at. So, um, and and we have good data on that, like with right, data, so. right. But I think, you know, Adam talking to him, his argument was more along along the lines of, you know, how long it takes a re a reintroduced population to hit that carrying capacity. And what he specifically said is, it seems like there's about a 20, 20 to thirty year window after restocking when they boom. Mm-hmm. It's a boom cycle for populations and then they hit a peak and then they start to come back down. And he said that Mississippi has the benefit of hindsight in the sense that they restocked before almost anybody else. And I mean, I think Alabama was kind of right on their heels. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they've seen po- some populations in certain areas around the state start to come back up already. I believe he said that mm-hmm. I, I'm not, I'm not as, as certain about that. No, but, I think you're right. Um, we, yeah. Uh, just for and those out s- there, we we did go back and listen to these and try to yeah. try to take some notes, but it it does get sure. hard because I think we spent right. over an hour with all of these people and yeah. I mean it's it's sort of like trying to drink through a fire hose or something, you know. Absolutely. Like they're, they're saying so much stuff and we're wanting to key in on it and they've already moved on right. three topics down the road before we get to it. It's hard to sure. do it. So we went back and tried to take notes and really contemplate a lot of these things they're saying and try to you know summarize it i guess uh, right and and then reflect on it and that's that's why, why we're here today uh trying to figure out okay based How on does this, this all fit together yeah, based on all the stuff we've heard what it what does it seem like is is going on what can we make of it so adam gave us an example from even within his own state of mississippi he said the trends seem to follow a pattern based on when restocking occurred in Mississippi, peaking first in the South where they started restocking. Mm-hmm. And then Northern Mississippi restocked later and it peaked later. And then in addition to that, you know, Craig mentioned that Kentucky, Virginia, and North Carolina, um, in that mid Atlantic region, mm-hmm. well, I guess, you know, exclude Kentucky from that, but definitely Virginia, and North Carolina, um, that their populations are still, trending to increase but the but they're increasing at a decreasing rate and they'll probably see declines beginning soon yeah um so we've got you know already one example of a population increasing over time and hitting some peak 20 30 years later um within a state Mm -hmm. mississippi and then we have other examples based on chronology of restocking across multiple states yeah that's a good so point. that's really that's an intriguing par- pattern that I was totally unaware of up until when we re- recorded those episodes yeah. the other day one that one of the things that kind of is resonating with me is that you know I, obviously as a scientist I get really kind of <laughs> excited about hypotheses but essentially we have competing hypotheses here that are testable and I like that mm-hmm. uh, yeah because I was just thinking of those same states and it was like, wow, okay, North Carolina, the restocking was relatively late and they're on the incline, but that at least around the, the research triangle area, that is one of the most rapidly growing human populations on the planet. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's crazy yeah. fast. I lived there for five years and it, w- it changed immensely in that time. And uh, that's an interesting thing that, you know, those, not in every area are those two hypotheses necessarily positively correlated. Like we literally may have areas where we have a different time since restocking and pattern and and human populations. I wonder if we overlaid that also with another competing hypothesis that I think Craig emphasized the most with predators. Everybody Mm -hmm. wants to, cast blame on predators and they are very commonly identified as a major source of of mortality at multiple life stages Uh, in fact the primary one at most most of the time Uh, and you know as well as i do everybody out there is probably already mad at us because of uh 
or look at the literature on that on the trapping topic but yeah uh we we may have situations where those three things don't overlap yeah yeah so and i think what this you know what all this really emphasizes to me is you know we have a i think it's part of our human nature to want to take sides and on this particular is- issue it seems like it's turned into you've got the habitat side you've got the predator side you've got the hunting regulation side mm-hmm. and everybody identifies with these camps almost like they're political parties <laughs> right but the reality is is all three of those factors are having an effect on any given population to some degree yeah right I mean, we may not have the mechanisms just right yeah. or what the effect size of them are relative to one another yeah. or how those effect sizes change in different right. contexts. But I think you're right that we can all agree that they're all having an effect. Yeah. And so I think it's, you know, our job as researchers and biology, biologists to start to identify and, you know, which of those is most important from one area to another mm-hmm so that we can pr- start prioritizing, you know, the leading issues for being addressed through management. Yeah. The specific to each of those areas. And that's one of the things that I mentioned in our conversation with Mike is that I think, you know, maybe, I don't know, I guess I've some somehow become a pseudo advocate for this, but, you know, coming from the deer world as Adam clearly described us <laughs> as deer biologists, yeah, you're right? Deer guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're the deer guys. He's not letting us in the circle. Um is, you know, more localized management. Yeah. And that can be specifically tailored to given situations across the landscape. But you have to have a lot of data to be able to do yeah. that. Well, I think that's an in- inherent problem with turkeys that that we don't have the level of data that we do on deer to make those kinds of decisions. And I think that that's one limitation. It's also just not part of the culture. Yeah. But uh, I, I agree with you, you know, in some States and in the, the hunting community certainly fusses about this plenty. And I'm one of them. Uh, some of the States are, you know, with, with uh, other hunted species, they're managing it at such a fine scale, it makes it very difficult to even know what you can do where. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I went out west elk hunting, that was the case. Like, I didn't know where I could, <laughs> where, yeah. I, where I was allowed to step and not. And there's all these different things. And one side of the road, you could do one thing, and the other side, you couldn't. So, uh, you know, it's it can get cumbersome. Well, and you and I have both told each other stories about calling up biologists in other yeah. states and saying, can you tell me what license I need? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's exactly right. Like we're literally like calling the Turkey coordinator to figure out what <laughs> we can do Turkey hunting wise. And, you know, when we go to a different state, so I, I certainly can see why there might be some resistance to that, but it would make a lot of sense. Like in the case with Adam, if we have pockets, in the state that have never had as many turkeys as they have and they're going you know they're just going rampant and Mm -hmm. why would we manage that necessarily the same as a three county area you know 150 miles away that they're they're near local extinction right like those are two different scenarios and we more you know at the we've been managing them more at the state level for this species, right. uh, you know, some states have a little bit of variation, but, uh, you know, we've been painting with a pretty broad brush in terms of what the season frameworks look like in general for this, yeah. for turkeys. And I, and I think Missouri is one of those states that's split their turkey seasons into more well-defined zones. Yeah. And I may, I may be incorrect, but I, I feel like I looked at a map missouri pretty recently and it was fairly broken up in terms of you know Mm -hmm. uh season regulations yeah and and in florida we have you know the the early season down south but uh that that's i think one important thing is this you know the state agencies have to think about what they can effectively do right Mm -hmm. and one thing that they can do is influence when and how much and how many people are allowed to take. 
Right. And, uh, you know, that's an important thing for us to consider is they're trying to do what, you know, they're trying to to wield the wand, so to speak, that they have at at their disposal. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't have perfect data to make those decisions. And, uh, you know, that we need to think about that. The other thing, and I think you brought it up initially when we were talking to Mike, I can't remember which one, but I think all of them agreed. Uh, when, uh, when we think back to it, everybody agreed that habitat improvement can make a big difference at the local yep. level for yep. turkey productivity. And yep. I think that's an important thing for us all thinking about this and what we can do individually. Not only can you affect how many birds you're, yep. you're harvesting or whatever, but, uh, the other thing that a lot of people have access to is manipulation of what the vegetation communities look like on their properties yeah. and yeah. trying to create a more conducive thing. Yeah. Can I, can I give you a quick rundown of uh, the habitat issues that each of our three interviewees brought up that stood out to me? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. Please do. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, they, like you said, they all had, to, had that in common. They mentioned habitat as a major factor influencing populations. And uh, the thing that Craig said that stood out to me was that um, 45% of the nests in their study, and just for uh, reiteration's sake, they monitored 600 nests. Okay. Wait, so 45. How many zeros? 600, two, six zero, zero. Two zeros on the end. So that, that is a huge sample size. Yeah. And they found that almost half, 45%, were located in cover types that comprised in total 7.5% of the landscape. So they had 3% of the landscape in early successional, mm -hmm. which is like old field, like true open um, environment. It's got an herbaceous understory, or herbaceous cover. There's no overstory, just herbaceous cover. And then uh, four and a half percent was shrubland, mm -hmm. and that's where forty five percent of nests were so located. Four, and nest success was higher in those areas yeah. too, even though a large portion of them got mowed up. Yeah, he said that was the other thing, right? The nest got twelve twelve percent. Just park your mower, and you can s increase nest success by twelve yeah. percent. Well, um, I, I think there's a couple of things about that. One, we got to do better. Yeah. Like why is we need more of the landscape to be that? And that's something that all of us can work toward is trying to do that. The other thing is, okay, early succession or shrubland. Well, that's what we failed to mow this year and what we failed mm -hmm. to mow last year too. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's what we're talking about. Uh, yeah. And not only did, were there a lot of nests that were directly mowed and lost because of mm -hmm. that, but we have this exceedingly small proportion of the landscape where almost half the nests are going. Like it's, that yeah. is a huge selection margin right there. Yeah. And then, you know, we're going in and mowing and putting the additional pressure, even if you're not mowing them during nesting, removing that cover for, you know, uh, for next year or whatever, like that's can still be an issue. And I think Craig mm -hmm. even keyed in on it being a problem during the, the dormant season uh you yeah know, when, when birds are using it for cover then so i i think that's a pretty important point that i definitely wanted to emphasize obviously since i jumped in here and kind of took over your <laughs> no that's fine that's that's totally fine and you know the thing it, it this does not mean that you do not disturb those areas right because what happens if you don't disturb them whatsoever is you lose your nesting yeah. and you lose your brooding habitat. They they require frequent disturbance. In fact, you know, one thing that I, I've been telling a lot of people is because I think this makes it makes the point more salient is to say that, you know, if you haven't disturbed an area in more than three years, you've lost your brooding habitat. Mm -hmm. That's um, pretty accurate. Or, you know, if you haven't disturbed it in, you know, five, six, seven years, you've lost your nesting mm -hmm. habitat. It's a little bit longer time frame. Yeah, you can. Um, so we're not saying don't that disturb by 20%. it. Percent, we're down here. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're not saying don't disturb that. Just, just pay attention to how you disturb right. it. With fire being better than mowing. Well, uh, here's it. But fire still erases that cover for a period, and that's yeah. why you make sure that you have a cover adjacent to mm -hmm. it. That can be used for that purpose while that covers. Well, you're back. you're keying in on a point that I wanted to 
to also emphasize is removing all that cover is necessary to maintain it. But when you remove all that cover and it was only 7% of the area that was available anyway, yes. like you almost can't disturb it without removing all of it. And that, yeah. that's really where the, you know, the, the intersection of these problems is coming together. Sure. You have to disturb them. But when it's such a small portion of the landscape, you're basically disturbing all of it. So then you're going, yeah. you have to, by default, have gaps and the yeah. availability and of we, it. Absolutely. And we really don't know how much of that habitat type we need for, for turkey populations to function optimally. Yeah, Adam brought that up, that we don't know what that but, number is. The number that I've been throwing around is like, I would like to see a landscape have at least like 25 to 30%, you mm-hmm. know, suitable nesting and brooding cover, yeah. you know, across the landscape. And then that gives you the flexibility, assuming it's not a exceedingly small property, that starts to give you the flexibility to disturb a portion of it one year and a portion mm-hmm. of it the next or even two years down the road. Yeah. I, I think that's a really important point of emphasis that at the local level, it, we as landowners and land managers, turkey enthusiasts that want more turkeys, that's something that we can influence individually and collectively mm-hmm. have a big impact at a larger scale. But you can definitely yeah. have a big impact on your own local scale, especially if two yeah. or three landowners that have a pretty good chunk of land get together and start right. doing that. You can have a big yeah. impact on it just from the habitat alone. Now, right. uh, I do want to talk about predators a little bit here as well from a few different contexts. One, another thing that has changed in this landscape is not just that we're declining in the amount of area for turkeys. It's also declining in quality. And I think Mike mm-hmm. said that, uh, something along those lines. But the, the, that that isn't just like a decline in how much food there is or how much nesting cover there is. The, the conflicting issue there is it is also becoming more conducive to a bunch of our problematic predators. Mm-hmm. So we're, you know, we're potentially having an increase in, in predators in less space, which itself is probably problematic. But the, the overlap in what turkeys are having to use and what raccoons are using is probably yeah. increasing as yeah. well. And I, I don't think people really think about that contextually, you know, uh, I think it's important to think about specifically, okay, not only is it declining in quality for hiding a nest, but it's also Mm -hmm. becoming more conducive for raccoons. Now, let's turn that around. Improving it for nesting and brooding will commensurately also decrease its value to the predator, in this case, raccoons. Mm -hmm. We're just using that as an example. So just by addressing the habitat, you can also address the predation, not just by making it easier or more difficult to find, but also by making yeah. it less conducive for that and potentially leading to declines of the predator itself uh, on that landscape. And I think that's been demonstrated fairly well with some of the telemetry stuff with uh, raccoons in particular, but also I believe with a couple of other predators. Mm-hmm. So that that's a, without even touching a predator trap. We can also, yeah. you know, improve a suite of things biologically in terms of the accessibility for turkeys on one side and also decrease the value on the other side for the predator. And I think that's important. Now, that's the kind of thing that gives me pleasant dreams at night, yeah. Marcus. So we're, <laughs> you know, we're the habitats addressing both at the same time. And I think they all. Uh, in their own ways, agreed with, you know, that line of thinking. The other thing that I, I think it is we need to revisit is we've talked about predation and the role of predation and trapping and the literature we we have emphasized is remarkably weak on mm-hmm. how how what the effect size that you could expect from trapping is and even what intensity you need to do it at and all those things. And everybody... Uh, throws tomatoes at us and everything but i mean that's a pretty objective look at the literature like it's weak 
Yes. Yeah. But one thing that's been pretty consistent and, and Craig really emphasized it. And, and when we were talking to him is there are people who are really well-respected, who know much more about turkeys than I do, who say that same kind of thing. And, and a lot of landowners as well, that when we've gotten the habitat together, adding trapping into that can have, you know, reap huge rewards. They always caveat, it seems like, when they always say both. And yeah. I agree with that. Uh, you, you know, don't try to get rid of all the predators if there's nowhere to nest anyway. Like, that's not the, right. that's not the leaky hole in the bucket, so to speak. But all of them seem to agree for the most part. And Craig, I think, emphasized it that adding the predator trapping on top of the habitat can reap a big reward. The problem that you and mm-hmm. I have is we haven't demonstrated that well in, in yeah. the literature, and it's shocking to me. And I'm I have hesitation, especially given the implications of that. And it's also something that's not really practical at large scales to, to you know, like the the state agency is not going to do that. Like that's not yeah. a practical thing. It's not digestible. But at the local level, you know, we need to know what the relative role is because it's another tool that we potentially have in the toolbox at the local scale to influence Mm -hmm. uh, how many turkeys there are. And ultimately we, I think we need to be addressing these things at both scales. That was a really long rant for me to basically say we need more data. Spot on. We need more data on both of those things, but don't think just because human populations are are growing rapidly and we're losing turkey habitat, that doesn't mean that you can't locally really impact positively yeah. or negatively the turkey population. Yeah. Like you can have a big effect and you can have a lot of turkeys in your area. And Adam and Adam did a really good job giving us a measure of that effect. Um, you know, so everybody, you know, you hear about what Craig mentioned relative to um the selection of where they nested and the nest success. But, you know, if you really want to catch a hunter's ear, you start talking about harvest densities and how, how many birds you can sustainably harvest on a per acre basis. Mm -hmm. And he said that statewide, their average is a harvest of one Turkey per about 1,200 acres, Mm -hmm. 1,200 acres statewide. But he says that on their clubs that he works with in Mississippi on the best managed property, they're killing a bird per 250 acres. Yeah. And he indicated five, that it was being done sustainably. Right. Five times as many birds. Yeah. Five to six, five to six times as many gobblers harvested per area, probably thanks to their investment in turkeys. Yeah. Some of the most well-managed properties. Yeah. They're probably not mowing their nest or their openings. Uh, I mean, we'd like to, joke about that but it really is i mean it it's become a i don't know if it's become or it's always been but it is a principal way across a large portion of the landscape that early succession is maintained in early succession Mm -hmm. craig says that you know all these guys are talking about that i see that everywhere i go and people get upset with you if you suggest they shouldn't get on the mower right oh i know i know um, and you know, that's, that's what another point that Adam made is he thinks the solution at the end of the day is, is more mowing? rooting habitat is <laughs> <laughs> more, well, you know, yeah, well, I, I think we're going to, we're going to get, we're going to get John Deere after us here pretty soon. Yeah. Um, but so he even made the point, <laughs> <laughs> he, he even made it a point to say that, and, and you ask him to repeat this statement. But he didn't hear you because he was. He, yeah, you know, he, he was had, in his groove. He was down the road. I didn't push he was it going. I just let him. I was letting him go. He was going, but you asked him to repeat it. But what he said when I went back and listened to it is that um, essentially all game birds. Didn't he say all game birds east of the Mississippi are declining? Well, I asked him to repeat it. I, <laughs> well, he mentioned he mentioned quail. Mm-hmm. Um, he mentioned rough grouse, pheasants. Uh, all declining because they've lost nesting and brooding habitat. Yeah. No, I'm I'm pretty sure that's what he said, yeah. 
And that was when I was yeah. like, whoa, wait, what? Yeah, because I'd never thought about it from that perspective. Yeah, I haven't either. And that's why I wanted him to repeat it and kind of mull it over and let's extract that. Because he, he really is super knowledgeable about a bunch yeah. of game species. I, he did a lot of work with quail uh, before he went into that, that turkey coordinator position. You know, he's he's a really, really g- great guy and really knowledgeable about a bunch of things. And when he said that, I was like, man, I need to pick his brain about that. Yeah, but he just he, he and, the ship was going too fast, and it was already yeah. it was already on its no. way. So yeah, and and I'm kind of embarrassed that I haven't thought about it that way because I even present a figure, and I I'm almost positive that I took that figure from a paper that was published out of Mississippi that shows um, trends and populations for northern bobwhites alongside uh, trends and populations for several early successional specialist songbirds. Mm-hmm. And they're all going the same direction. And I show that in my class to make the point that, you know, predation is a part of of what's going on with these birds. But it's also, you know, when you see a guild of species, uh, this group of species that all have similar habitat requirements declining at the same time, you know, that points you back every time to it being a habitat issue. Yeah. And I think to, to say that in a different way or more directly or or – I'm not sure what, how I'm adding to what you just said, but <laughs> another way to think about that is, okay, we, all these early succession obligates and early succession assisted species that have mm-hmm. some key component of their life history. Facultative. Yeah, there you go. Uh, to have all of those with that happening at the same time, that's not because there's more raccoons in the fields. It's because there, yeah. there's not any good early succession by and large across right. the landscape like that right. that's what drives that kind of pattern and not to say that you know having less of it and more raccoons can't comp- complement one another to be detrimental sure. but sure you know that is a symptom of a b- broader problem and no individual is going to solve all that at once but we need to all be thinking about it because that's something mm-hmm. you know having a few high quality brood patches on your property is something that a lot of landowners can accomplish. Like just mm-hmm. don't plant it or don't mow it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, get rid of the, the, the carpet as Craig likes yeah. to say, the, the, right. uh, you know, the mat forming grass and then, yeah. you know, let it, let it move into a foreblend. I've been trying to say foreblend yeah. because Everybody always says grassland, and I think that's a misnomer. And Craig has been kind of beating that into my head for years and years now. <laughs> and one time he said Portland. <laughs> uh, well, I had a student one time that I actually want it to be dominated in grass. You know, he said that the, you you kind of extracted out him a specific number, and I think he said 30% grass cover. If you're over yeah. that, even if it's native warm season grass, it's, it's not what you're looking for. And I feel like he keeps cutting down that number more and more. He used to be, I feel like he used to be around 50%. And then I last, well, that, that's what I thought he was going to say 40. was 50, but it, lots of things have changed over the years. And actually, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I don't recall which year it was, but I, I was working with him essentially 2007 through thir- 2009 with my masters. And it was, you know, I, I, I mean, it was like drinking through a fire hose then too. I didn't really have much resonate because it was just there's so much going on he's so knowledgeable about all that but there were some things that i remembered particularly related to forest stand improvement and a couple of things related to food plots and some things with early succession that i kind of had you know a, a scaffolding of of the way i thought about them that came from working with them and last year I was, or maybe in the year before I was up in Tennessee with him, we were going and looking at one of the experiments we're working on and, and, uh, did some turkey hunt together and, and, uh, he had changed on one of those things. I think it was related to forest stand improvement. And I said, well, mm-hmm. Craig, that's not what we, what we learned about back in the day. And he's like, well, we didn't know what the hell we were talking about back then. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I did all this stuff and, you know, he's changing and, with with his data and that's how a lot of this is you know with science and um i think you know the world got a a front row seat 
to all this and you know how science evolves over time sometimes at a very rapid rate mm -hmm. with the covid pandemic you know regardless of how you think it was handled or your thoughts on the whole thing whatever you know we saw very different stories and some of it was politicized mm -hmm. and that muddied the water but the stories changed it seemed like from one week yeah. to the next even, because yeah. even from the science, governments were throwing yeah. yeah governments were throwing so much money at the research and the state of the knowledge was constantly changing yeah. Well, I, um, I even I kind of kept my finger on the pulse of the literature on it, where it's peer-reviewed science, and it was right. like the scientists were all arguing with each other. Yeah, and it was really yeah. cool to watch because some of them, like you know, there would be a paper published in the Lancet, and then that paper would get five hundred responses. Yeah, and then all of those right. would get a bunch of responses, and they're literally like having a real time conversation about it. And you're right now yeah. with technology, like what we're using right now, it's really visible to people. And I guess we're yes. sort of trying to do the same thing with turkeys because there's, you know, one it's it uh, lets everybody understand that all of this stuff is evolving. Like we're not certain on what you know all these mechanisms. I think one thing that we can all agree with is we want turkeys they need habitat to produce and they need to not get eaten so mm -hmm. you know we're kind of focusing on and we can't shoot them all before they breed yeah yeah if you shoot all of the males and there aren't any to breed that's going to be a big deal yeah. it doesn't matter really when the timing is then you know yeah um uh, right so you know there's some uncertainty here and then we have other things that are sort of like pillars that we're building that, you know, we're building on these pillars, but, uh, there's a little bit of uncertainty on exactly how to maximize our success in all these different areas. And right. We're sort of trying to put a spotlight on that, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, I think, I think one thing that's been very frustrating to everyone um, related to this whole situation, or maybe, it, maybe I'm just speaking, you know, from personal experience, but with the habitat issue, you know, people are seeing declining populations and that's very concerning. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, those who are most concerned are the landowners and the passionate turkey hunters who no longer have the ability to even hunt a turkey on their property. Mm -hmm. They've lost all the turkeys there, you know, and, um, habitat change doesn't happen immediately. And that's oftentimes the reason why particularly state agencies look at what can we change right now today mm -hmm. to try to stop the bleeding, you know? Yeah. And so that's why they're pulling some of those levers. Um, but, you know, longer term, we need to definitely be looking at, you know, understand, of course, understanding that whole process better. I mean, that's been the basis of this entire conversation we've had today. Um, but I think, you know, one thing that Mike said that resonated with me was that, we need to think of ways to incentivize landowners to manage for turkeys at the local level too. Mm -hmm. And we've done that for other species of plants and animals. Um, so, you know, why not do it for turkeys too? Yeah. I think that's a really important point. And again, like you said, all the, that whole guild of species will benefit. Sure. You know, we, we need programs like the early succession in particular. I've, I've been on the, on that one for a while now because i just see it i mean it, it's just such a big problem mm -hmm. so ubiquitously across the landscape yeah. and to the degree where and it's I tell because people, it's labor intensive yeah i tell people this is what you're trying to get and they don't even know what i'm saying and then i don't even have any opportunity to show them because it doesn't yeah. exist in the landscape yeah and it's yeah sure you know that's uh you know, if we had programs that were helping landowners to do that instead of the alternative practices that, that it's being used for or to offset the cost, you know. So, in other words, it could be lost opportunity cost as well with doing mm -hmm. that. If we could off, offset that somehow, uh, you know, we could probably get a lot, lot higher buy-in. Yeah, sure. I think that's a good point. Yeah. Well, uh, is there any other topics that we didn't get to on here uh, again i'm because i read so slowly and i write so poorly I, i'm not <laughs> sure if i missed something in mine but uh, at least your voice sounds great today. oh my gosh isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think we've covered most of the 
most of the stuff that I had highlighted in my notes. Um, so I guess that, I mean, I feel like we just had a pretty good summary mm -hmm. um, discussing, you know, what challenges we're facing and what opportunities there are. Um, I guess to loop back to the beginning of this conversation, this is by no means a settled topic. I mean, this, yeah. this episode series, I think hopefully, at least for me, it was very enlightening. I hope it's very enlightening for our listeners. Um, but we, don't take us wrong in that we're concluding that, you know, one way or another about season dates, you know, our objective with this was just to establish what is the state of the knowledge mm -hmm. relative to that and the weight of the evidence of season dates playing a role in turkey population growth rates yeah. um, and kind of talk a little bit about, you know, some of the uncertainties that we still need to address. And, and like I said, at the end of the day, I absolutely think additional research in this area is merited. Yeah, it's a really important thing. And I, I think I said it with Mike, but I don't want us to have to go 25 years down the road and figure out whether or not we did the right thing. Right. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the values yeah. of doing these things experimentally and measuring that response and then trying to make decisions based on that as you, you know, uh, you don't have to kind of try and see. And then if it's going to take three yeah. decades to correct, well, we don't need to wait that long to see if it didn't. Yeah. So. But I do feel like we are getting to the point where we're going to have data here pretty soon that's going to give us a pretty good indication if this is going to work. At the statewide level, many states are changing their season openings in response to this. Hopefully, they're continuing to collect data consistent with, you know, the way that they did it before mm -hmm. they implemented those changes so that we can assess those indices like hunter harvest to see if the, if the trends are reversing mm -hmm. and you're starting to see a stabilization or increase of populations. And then you've got, you know, people like Adam Butler in Mississippi and uh, Mark McConnell and Dana Morin mm -hmm. in Mississippi State that are working with him. On um, that research project, you've got the research project that uh, Craig Harper and Dave Bueller are leading up in Tennessee, and then you've got Mike leading that work, mm -hmm. you know, where they're doing it in South Carolina, looking at the, comparing the unhunted site to the hunted site that's close by. Um, so all that, you know, cohesively or collectively, however you want to say it, um, should start painting a pretty clear mm -hmm. picture of what's going to happen in response to these changes in the pretty near future. Yeah, that's really good, really good point. And I'm glad, you know, we're trying to do the same yeah. thing in Florida. So, yeah, really good stuff. Um, one thing uh, I just wanted to impress upon the audience, you know, we don't always hit the right topics or we don't always explain everything. And, you know, sometimes as scientists, we might miss it. If, you know, if you have questions about it or you have a thought process or whatever, please share that with us because we're going to use it to you know, kind of guide us through mm -hmm. this. And I, you know, this is the kind of topic where I could see us coming back to it, especially yeah. since there's a lot of ongoing work, like, you know, that some of these things are going to change. Uh, some of them are going to get published and there's more certainty around them. So we're probably going to revisit stuff and maybe we didn't ask a question that you all are wondering about to one of these people. So share that with us and uh, we will definitely try to incorporate it into the show. And, Mm -hmm. Along those same lines, you know, share this with with other folks. Ultimately, this is about getting information out to people and having our audience help us do that is is necessary yeah. to maximize the impact. Especially, you know, if you're one of those landowners that that uh, is isolated by the land management around you or the turkey management around you, you know, there could be a lot of benefit from making sure those people or uh, listening in and taking in some of these concepts that may drive some action to, to promote some real change and, and help everybody out. So ultimately if we can get everybody thinking about that, I, I think that's one thing we all agree on is that we can move the needle collectively. Mm -hmm. It's really a question of how to get us all to, to move on it. Yeah. And that's the whole intent of this podcast. Yeah. And um, you know, we hit some of the wave tops related to things like habitat management and predation um, and some of the some of the things we spoke on related to that may have intrigued you or confused you maybe you didn't you don't understand what we we're talking about or like what you were saying Marcus uh, a lot of landowners don't even understand what early succession means yeah. um, or, or maybe so we you think we're wrong which is 
yeah, you know, with, that's true with too. Will, that's pretty common occurrence. So it is every day. <laughs> um, just ask my family, yep. but, um, we're going to be doing deeper dives on all those topics, you know, to try to give you guys actionable information, telling you what we know, telling, telling you what the literature, you know, going back as far as we need to says about it as well. And trying to be kind of a clearing house for that type of information to make you a more effective, you know, Turkey manager and, and to hopefully pass the word along to others so that we can continue to, uh, meet this challenge, yeah. you know? Good points. Good stuff. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for listening. We really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, we're going to keep going after these topics. So please keep listening, share it with your friends, rate the podcast, help us spread the word. Absolutely. Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow, a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey. To learn more about TFT, check out turkeysfortomorrow.org.